Dear friends, I am Shoibal Shingupta with Dr. Jayant Gogoi. Like to make a tour with you on a very well known but still a perplexing event of amphibian social behavior that is parental care in amphibia. Research on this topic was initiated in the early part of last century but information on this still pouring on even today. Now the learning objectives of today's deliberation will be what do we mean by parental care? What are the driving forces of evolution of parental care in amphibia? What are the different modes of parental care in amphibia? The diversity of parental care in three lineages of amphibia? What vivibility means in amphibia? And evolutionary status of parental care in amphibia? Parental care is a behavioral and evolutionary strategy. We can define it as a pattern of behavior where parent increases the evolutionary fitness of the offspring by investing parent's own energy and time. Now in what forms the care may be offered? It may be offered in terms of preparing an environment where rearing can be possible, that is a physical rearing environment. It can be in the form of provisioning of offspring, that is supplement with nourishment or it may be in the form of defending offspring from predators. Parental care is a type of altruism. It involves increasing the fitness of the offspring at the expense of the offerers that the parents. Spending time and energy is detriment to the parents' individual fitness, but at the same time it increases the fitness of the offspring. So parental care is any parental behavior that increases offspring fitness at the cost of the carer. It may range from short term and relatively simple behaviors such as attendance of eggs to long term and elaborate adaptations like some form of food provisioning viviparity and lactation. Lactation is also includes in the sense of specialized nourishment. Now this behavior is extremely common amongst various groups of animals right from arthropod to mammals. Now let's look at the we know there are three lineages in amphibia and it occurs in all the three lineages Anura represented by toads and frogs, Eurodella represented by the salamanders and Gymnophiona or Apoda represented by the Sicilians. Now here in when it can be given? Care can be given before hatching of the egg, eggs and also after hatching. Before hatching may occur through laying eggs in protective cover, eggs in foam nest or laying eggs in secured places like tree holes, rock crevices etc. Second form of care before hatching is guarding eggs in the side of oviposition. That means where the eggs are laid. And the third 
is attending the direct developing eggs. Direct developing means where the larval stages are not there. Care after hatching may be transportation of tadpoles from terrestrial oviposition site to water. It may be directly or indirectly. Carrying eggs and tadpoles throughout development to metamorphosis. Provisioning eggs by female as food for tadpoles. It may be in the form of trophic eggs. Also in the form of uterine milk, ectotrophoblasts, etc. as it found in Sicilians. And like mammals, internal gestation within that. Ovita. In amphibians, unique form of parental care have evolved in response to inhospitable environment to enhance the offspring survivorship. Offspring nourishment encompasses a continuum from lysithotrophy, that is yolk bearing nourishment, to metrotrophy or metritrophy that is nourishment provided through ma mother's tissue and that both these are combined with oviparity and viviparity. Wilson categorized environmental and ecological characteristics that drive evolution to parental care which includes high level of predation. Number two, limited or rare food supply. Number three, unusually harsh environmental conditions. And number four, a stable and structured habitat. All the, of all these, the first three is very clear. What is a stable and structured habitat? How it causes, does that? parental care in stable structure habitat. Cake selection is very dominant as a result of which the species produce few offspring and that require maximum attention. Predation pressure has a strong impact on parental care in terrestrial breeding species. Why? In arboreal breeding species, is the, it is the harshness of environment. In other cases, limited food supply for tadpole has been associated with resulting in trophic feeding in which adults purposely de deposit unfertilized eggs as food source to the larvae or the tadpole. Now this phenomenon is known as oophagy. Oophagy may be of two types. Both are involved in parental care or types of parental care. One is larval oophagy in which the adult used to lay eggs as food for the tadpole. And the second one is adult oophagy, in which the adult used to remove the infected eggs, eggs which are infected by molds. Ten different modes of parental care are recognized in amphibians. And that's a listed here. Of this protective a cover, secured oviposition site and egg attendance by far the most common modes of amphibian parental care. At present parental care has been documented in large number of amphibian families and parental care is extremely diverse across species ranging from very simple behavior 
to complex adaptation, varying in duration and also in the sex that is male or female offering the parental care. In terms of simple to com complex, the egg attendance is the simplest care behavior. Brooding and vivibility are complex behavior of parental care. Again, transport, oophagy with matrophagy are also extremely complex. Parental care may also include a continuous prolonged care right from the fertilized egg to later developmental stages even up to the juvenile. Parental care may involve only single parent that we called as monoparental or maybe both the parents. Let's now look at annulance. In particular, parental care in annulance has been associated with five life history traits. The direct development, small clutch size, that means small number of eggs laid and large embryo. Just contrary to this, relatively large class size and small eggs, lotic breeding habits and breeding size with small water bodies. Protective egg cover and secured laying site is most common and found in almost all groups where the female lays protecting eggs and also eggs are laid in habitat which are protected against harsh conditions and predators. In addition, several species of frogs construct nests or settlers of leaves or any other materials in which the eggs are laid. In Copigellas biroi, large eggs are laid in a sausage-shaped transparent membranous bag secreted by the female and is left in the mountain stream for development. Amongst amphibians, recoveries have a variety of reproductive modes, aquatic breeding, arboreal breeding, direct development, or laying eggs in foam nest, or even in terrestrial gel nests. Rachophoras, Jungixellas, and Polypedites make foam nest where eggs are kept moist as well as provide with nourishment. In Dattafrainas Chandai, as you can see, advanced embryo. Eggs are laid in long string inside thick gelatinous mass. As we talked about polypeditis, the most common tree frog the polypedity terrainsis used to form foam nest overhanging water bodies and the hatched larvae then dropped from the overhead foam nest into the aquatic actually in polypedity himalayansis amazing type of reproductive behavior and protective laying of eggs are found. The amplicting pair moves on the leaf litter or vegetation reaching the damp ground. The female with the mounted male on her back lays on her belly 
with limbs spread sidewise to press the soft ground. This compaction of the soft and damp ground was continued by the pair by moving in anti-clockwise direction until a smooth circular shallow pit with a raised wall that is the circumference is formed. After pit formation, she climbed out of the pit, positioned her feet, a vent on the rim of the pit and lays eggs in for the mass forming the foam nest. With rain, the wall is destroyed and the larvae are washed away in nearby water bodies. In Jangixilus legally, the female of the amplecting pair removes soil with the hind limbs and bury themselves to a depth of several centimeters in the damp earth on the edge of ditch or flooded rice field. The female then forms a spherical hole pushing the soil with the fore and hind limb. The female releases a secretion from cloaca which is bitten into a froth and the eggs are deposited into the froth. The pair makes an exit gallery towards the ditch which is obliquely downwards towards the water through which they move out after laying. Let a same exit gallery is used by the larvae to reach the water to complete the development. Tree frog Buana Faber protects larvae by building a basin shaped nest or nursery in shallow area near the bank of pond. The female scoops mud up to a depth of 7.5 to 10 cm and a circular wall is built around the nest by the scooped mud. The wall emerges out of water surface. The inside wall is made smooth by the hands and the base by the belly and the hands. The eggs and early larvae are thus protected from predators. With heavy rains, the wall is destroyed and larvae go to the water. In some, the behavior helps in protection. For example, wood frog eggs are, eggs are laid while ponds are still cold and mold growth is slow and quickly hatches to prevent infection. Many species are explosive breeders. Explosive breeding during pond formation gives frog larvae a temporal advantage over their predators. Because the aquatic predators like the dragonfly larvae are deprived of spatial accommodation in the due to the accumulation of the large number of larvae of tadpole, they are deprived of the space in the small water bodies. Nest building by leaf folding is reported in Afrixellus, Phylomedusa, Jangixellus omeomantis and Racophorus lateralis. The last one, the Racophorus lateralis, is a western gut endemic. The lateralis forms a purse-like nest made over water by folding a single leaf around the egg mass by the female alone after oviposition to prevent desiccation of eggs in open sunlight. Multiple leaf nesting behavior is also known from three other western gut endemics Racophorus calcadensis, Racophorus pseudomalabaricus and Racophorus malabaricus. Again, presence of jelly-like coating preventing the egg from desiccation as well as infection by fungi 
being found in Curicillus idioticus, the, where the egg masses are deposited on land in close proximity to water. The eggs have two jelly-like coating, the outer one being tough and non-sticky, and the eggs are laid in secluded places like depression in the ground, under stones, in crevices or holes, and are sometimes covered with dead leaves. Protective jelly layer prevents mold from reaching the embryos. Leptobrachella chasiorium is a species found only in the Hushi Hills, deposits eggs under side rocks that are flatly embedded on the gravel and over leafy bottom of the dead stream bed. The eggs are covered with transparent jelly, showing adaptations for terrestrial development in sheltered microhabitats via avoidance, avoidance of moisture loss and damage of eggs from solar radiation. Mat packing of eggs is also found in various groups of amphibians. In Rauchestis ectoparalogy, which has direct development, female excavates a cavity in uh, a suitable place to lay eggs. As they have direct development, there is no free swimming tadpole spring. This strategy makes fully terrestrial reproduction possible. Female locates a suitable spot, excavates a cavity where the eggs are laid. After oviposition, the female mixes eggs with the soil. Probably, soil provides micronutrients, protection against desiccation, also against predators. In Curixillus naso, unique behavior of marked packing of eggs occur. The eggs are laid in terrestrial burrow. The male parent kicks the eggs sprayed and mixed with top loose layer of moist soil, giving them, them a seed-like appearance. Therefore, the eggs probably masquerade as seeds and thereby reduce predation. The oviposited eggs possess a thick gelatinous jelly. Prior to hatching, this behavior appears to protect them from desiccation and predates. A very unique type of mat packing is reported from Nictibetracus kumbara. The female has a clutch size of 5, releases eggs in the handstand position and stuck them to twig. The male stood on limbs and touch the twig to identify the clutch position and twig. After identifying the twig with eggs, the male collects mud from the stream bed on its hand and spread it on the egg clutch while standing on its hind limb. This is repeated several times to cover all the eggs with mud. As stated, it helps in getting protection against predator, desiccation and also the micronutrient from the soil. Another strategy of parental care is the attendance of egg and larvae. Egg attendance is one of the most common mode of parental care in which a parent remains with an egg mass at a fixed location. By investing in egg attendance, 
Amphibians can increase offspring survivorship by reducing or preventing developmental abnormalities, predation and desiccation. Two terms are commonly used in parental care attendance of broods, egg guarding and egg defense. Egg guarding is a behavior that prevents attack by predators. This can be manifested by inflating the body, readjusting posture to block eggs from predators, striking or biting predators, or any other physical intervention preventing attack by pre predators. Whereas egg defense, which is a subset of egg guarding, where the attending adult kills or eats predators as a form of preventing depredation. It is the most extreme and effective form of egg guarding. It has been suggested that by guarding eggs, the adults may reduce fungal infection of embryos. This egg guarding may be in the form of physical attending the egg, turning the egg, even oophagy to remove infected eggs. Egg guarding is more pronounced in males. For example, in the bullfrog, Lithobates scatisbenius, male establish and defend territories which increases larval survivorship because the larvae have lower densities of leeches that feed on the eggs and tadpoles when that are attended by the adult. Egg attendance by male, Curixillus effingeri, results in increased egg survivorship. Positive effects of parental care occurs against predation by the invasive slug and against mold infection. The presence of the caring males reduce the predation of the slug and is also linked to an increase in hatching success while skin peptides act as their factors limiting mold infection in Curixillus effingeri. Male attendance is also found in case of alitis. The alitis female expels a strand of eggs and that eggs are fertilized externally by males. The male then wraps these fertilized eggs around his legs and carry the eggs while it moves. This results in the protection of eggs from the predators in the water. When the eggs are ready to hatch, the male walks into shallow water and the hatch tadpoles leap out of the male guarding the eggs is also found in Oreophrine oviprotector, a Papuan microhylid frog, in which the female used to lay eggs underside the leaves, hanging 30 to 40 centimeter above the ground, and the male of the Oreophrine oviprotector guard the eggs of their mates on the underside of leaves. In Papuan microhylid frogs, where the development is direct, prim two primary causes of egg mortality being recognized. 
in audio frying. It is the desiccation and this audio frying by gu male guarding desiccation is prevented. Whereas predation is the main source of mortality for the terrestrial frog. Male attendance has also been reported from Rochester, in which the adult males and females enter hollow internodes of bamboo through small, small narrow openings located towards the base of internodes. Small number of eggs are laid by the female and adult males remain inside and provided, provides egg attendance until eggs hatch. Similar type of attendance is also reported from Calliopus robustus which sits on a clump of eggs enclosed in an elastic gelatinous envelope. Now, egg attendance though is dominant in male but also found in female. In Feihyla, there is a Feihyla ancini, Feihyla kajo as well as Feihyla vatita ta. Egg guarding is performed by female and the female contributes to the offspring survivorship. In all these three species, the parent positions the posterior portion of its body and hind leg over the egg clutch. Harsh environmental conditions for offspring appear to be the prime mover of parental care in this group. A very complex form of parental care is expressed in terms of transport, transportation of egg and larvae. All species of dendrobatids and aromobatids deposit terrestrial eggs and then transport their tadpoles to a small tree hole or other types of water holding plants for development. It looks very simple but transport has various facets. First, the parent must have a very good spatial memory of suitable pools with low predation rigs in which to release the offspring. And this offer of the parent is actually regulated by the tadpole whether it is to be transported as well as where to actually disembark. A parent does not simply pick up a tadpole. A tadpole climbs onto parent's back and it is the tadpole choice accepting the ride the adult offers. A parent does not simply deposit it a tadpole. It is again the tadpole choice in which a tadpole retains control over whether it accepts the parent's offer of a nursery by disembarking. This process also involves some level of parent-offspring conflict and sibling competition specifically when parents can only take one or few offspring at a time. In Ranitumoya ventribaculator, promiscuity is common. Here the larval habitat is a small amount of water held in the leaf axil. The female attaches four to eight eggs to leave of submerged aquatic vegetation where the eggs are inseminated by the male. Tadpoles after hatching are one by one by the male carried 
to minute water bodies. Many tadpoles from different classes are either transported to the same axil or allowed to slide into the pool as they develop from egg attached just above the water line. Cannibalism is common among the tadpoles and may provide a significant source of nutrients for the tadpoles. Now, so far we talked about monoparental parental care, biparental mode involving both the parents at the same time that is simultaneously or succeeding one another is also encountered in annulants. Survivorship of embryos significantly decreased in the absence of the attending parent and embryonic mortality may be caused by fungi infection, egg desiccation, egg cannibalism, predation by mostly by arthropods and abnormal development. Breeding adults can provide protection to the developing offspring by aggressive defense of territories on which eggs are deposited, ingesting potential arthropod predators as well as also by egg turning. In Randitomea vaginally, males and females form fair and remain together in small territory. Class size is very small, about three eggs, and eggs are laid above the water line on the wall of a small tree hole or vine hole. Developing tadpoles are transported singly by the male to another size. As the tadpoles are cannibalistic, they are not allowed to drop into water in the same tree hole where a larger tadpole may be present. Only one tadpole occupies a small tree hole. The female and male come in contact that is caught about every five days. Then the female ovulates two eggs, one from each ovary and the eggs are unfertilized. The male guides her to the tree hole containing one of their tadpole and the female deposit the trophic eggs for the tadpoles to consume, that is oophagy. Similar <coughs> Similarly, in Anomola glossus BB, male and female form a pair bond and both parents provide parental care. The male parent cares for the egg by moistening them and transports the tadpoles. The female parent occasionally deposits trophic eggs for the tadpoles. The parents remain together on a small territory defended by the male. Monogamy and biparental care have also been reported in the highlight Osteocephalus oophagus. Oophagy is obligatory in this species. The amplating pair deposits a clutch of about 250 eggs in a tree hole. Male and female parents return about every five days to deposit more fertilized egg for the uh, developing tadpoles to consume. After a month some tadpoles metamorphosis and leave the tree holes. Eggs continue to be deposited in the same tree hole, but not all of them are consumed by the older tadpoles. And these uneaten eggs hatch into more tadpoles. As a result, tadpoles of different sizes are present in a pool. Generally, smaller ones are unable to obtain trophic eggs and they are being consumed by the larger one. In Ufega pomelio, a female lays a clutch of about five eggs in the leaf litter. 
Open position is followed by three phases of parental care. Males attend the clutch until tadpole hatch. Females then transport tadpoles to a nursery, a small body of water usually contained within plant tissue, either tea, leaf, exhale or tree hole like that. Then for about six weeks, mother returned to this rear ring site periodically to lay the unfertilized eggs upon which tadpoles feed. Next, viviparity or light bearing viviparity is often used to include all modes of light bearing and includes two different types oviviparity and uviviparity. In oviviparity, the eggs are lecithotrophic that means full of yolk and the embryonic development is supported by the yolk of the eggs and the birth occurs as larva that is larviparity or as juvenile that is puriparity. In uviviparity metrotrophy occurs in amphibians a diversity of non-placental ways of ingesting nutrients occurs, the mother provides the nourishment which is called as metrotrophy and puriparity that means in uviviparity always but occurs as juvenile or frognate. Three major modes of light bearing reproduction occurs in amphibians annuals. That's a back brooding, brooding in mouth and in stomach and intra oviductal brooding or development. In back brooding fertilized, egg, fertilized eggs are deposited either in a pouch formed of the skin of the mother dorsum or embedded directly in the dorsal skin with the young born either as a late larvae that is larvae parity or as metamorphs that is as which is we called as puriparity and that's the puriparous. There are three types of back brooding orcas exposed brood pouch in Brazilian tree frog Phrygiana the female carries the eggs on the back with an exposed brood pouch and release the tadpoles into bromeliads. Covered brood pouch in flecto flectonotus, the eggs are placed in a skin covered brood pouch which is open posteriorly in front of the cloacal aperture and third type of back brooding is in cell like pouches which is found in case of gastrotheca which is a terrestrial frog and in piper which is an aquatic frog. In breeding season the back skin of female become thick, vascular, soft and gelatinous. The female releases eggs one by one and the males after fertilization the, guides the eggs into the entrance of a permanent dorsal skin pouch on the back of the female. Then each egg sinks into a small pouch over which develops a cover that's an operculum. Operculum is dual in origin which comes from a remnant of egg envelope and also by integumental secretion. The young develops moist and safe in maternal tissue between the invaginated pits arise a rich vascularization. It is suggested that metabolic exchange takes place between maternal and embryonic tissue which is just like of primitive placenta. 
mouth breeding occurs in a highly threatened species known as Rhinoderma darwini. Just after fertilization, the eggs are swallowed and the developing embryos are maintained in the vocal sac of the male up to metamorphosis. There is indirect evidence of potential paternal nutrition via secretion from the epithelium of sacs until the young are born as metamorphosis. And that's also a type of metrotrophy. Stomach breeding is found in two extinct species of Rheobatrochus. Females of Rheobatrochus ingest their just fertilized eggs and broods them in their stomach until they are born through the mouth that is regurgitated as juvenile frogs. The developing embryos secrete a particular prostaglandin that inhibits gastric secretion in the mother's stomach so that the young are not digested. And as I stated, there are two stomach breeding species which are now considered. The third mode of viviparity is intraoviductal development. In aneurysms, only one of the known 17 intraoviductal viviparous species is larviviarus, which is a species of Limnonectis, Limnonectis larvae apparatus. Intraoviductal development either without post of maternal nutrition but birth as fully metamorphosed foglets or with provision of nutrients after yolk resorption and birth as a fully metamorphosed juveniles are found. A few aneurysm species, mostly buffonoids and the extinct electrodactylus are ovibepiparas retaining yolky fertilized eggs in the oviducts and the yolk provides nourishment to the developing embryo after the metamorphosis and these frogs giving birth to fully metamorphosed froglets. In case of two small East African toads, nectophrinoids, viviparas, which is a terrestrial species and is ovoviviparous. In this toad, fertilization is internal and the eggs are lecithotrophic, developed through the larval stage inside the mother's oviduct, eventually emerging as fully formed juvenile toads, that is, puri. Paris. Another species is the nectophrine taurine Internal fertilization takes place. Again, eggs are lecithotrophic and it is ovoviviparous and shows puriparity. Euparity or euviviparity rather occurs in nimbatodes, nimbophrinoids, which are true viviparous with metrotrophy that is maternal provision of nutrition during gestation and puriparity the birth of juveniles. Then we'll, let, let's look into the parental care in salamanders. Parental care in salamanders is limited. Acatic species which are lotic breeders, that is embryonic stage is long and embryo are large, use hidden nest, mostly subterranean sites, that is underground sites for nest building. Spotted salamanders, Ambiostoma maculatum, lay eggs in ephemeral pools, 
so fish very rarely frequent the water bodies and thus provide protection against the fish predators. The eggs are wrapped in a protective jelly that prevents mold from reaching the embryos. In another species of ambiostoma, ambiostoma opacum, female construct nest and lay eggs under virtually any cover where the nest is likely to be flooded by subsequent winter rains. The nest attendants by the female have higher hatching success. In Andreas japonicus, the large male which are found in the den or in, uh, which are found in the burrows called den master occupies burrows along the stream bank for breeding and nesting. The den master exhibits three behaviors, tail fanning to provide oxygen to the water for the eggs. Agitating, agitating the eggs with his head and body prevents yolk adhesion. And egg eating, the den master selectively eats with whiter eggs that appear to be dead or infected with water molds. This behavior of egg eating is termed as hygienic filial cannibalism. And it's a coditor or the urinal lay eggs in dry hole in ground or tree hole. Both parents remain in the hole to protect the eggs and larvae and also providing them moisture. In Desmognathus fuscus, the eggs are laid in the form of rosary like string and the string is wrapped round the body. Salamandra and Martincelia are live bearer, live bearer, that is, viviparity is intra ovidactyl. Salamandra atra is euviviparous with metatrophy and puriparity. Salamandra salamandra and its subspecies are oviviviparous, larviparous, and eggs are lecithotrophic. Further, one subspecies of salamandra salamandra practices intra ovidactyl cannibalism as the post yolk mode of maternal nutrition and birth of metamorphs. Post hatching parental care is known only in one of the salam Italian cave salamander that is Speleomantis strinaneti, which lay eggs in small depression. During egg breeding, the female remained in contact with the clutch, hatching repeatedly climbed over the female's body, that's the mother's body, lying on her for hours. The females walked out of the nesting site with young on its back. The third lineage that is the Sicilians. Sicilians are unique in exhibiting a large array of reproduction modes that includes Obibibiparas to Bibiparas. And that's a combined with high investment strategies like lecithotrophic eggs, guarding of eggs, and as well as unusual investment strategies, production of ectotrophoblasts, skin feeding, as well as intrauterine feeding. Ichthyophis and hypogeophis are both oviparous. They lay lecithotrophic eggs in burrows of diamond soils and coil round them until they hatch, protecting the eggs from predators as well as moistening, keeping the moisture of the eggs. 
viviparous reproductive mode is found in schistometopum as well as thoneropeton in which the development is direct that is no larval stage giving birth to the live young the Sicilian also exhibits ovoviviparity encompassing metrophagy. Bollingerula titanus and Siphonops annulatus are direct developing oviparous Sicilian. They used to lay eggs and this developing offspring are provided with nutrients. The skin of both is transformed into brooding females to provide a rich supply of nutrients for the developing offspring. The, both these species are showing direct development without any larval stage and the young animals are equipped with a specialized type of dentition which they use to peel and eat the outer layer of their mother's modified skin which is nutritive in nature. This new form of parental care provides a plausible intermediate stage in the evolution of viviparity in Sicilian. In viviparous Sicilians, the youngs are fed with intrauterine materials. During development, the fetus is scrapped on the uterus epithelium by a specialized set of embryonic teeth. And this scrapping of epithelium stimulates the segregation of a secretion of the uterus epithelium which is often referred to as uterine milk. This type of feeding, feeding on the uter, uter, intrauterine epithelium or the resultant uterine milk is found in Dermophis mexicans as well as an Indian endemic Gegenophis sesasari. In case of Gymnophis, the young are born and they are proceed to feed on a milk-like substance secreted by the mother. Just unlike intrauterine feeding, here the youngs are fed with milk-like substances, substances secreted from the female body. Typhlonectis is a viviparous Sicilian having a gestation lasting about six months. On completion of gestation, it will give birth to two to four young and these young are fed on skin patch or dilated gills. The skin patch which provides nourishment to the young is called as ectotrophoblast and this ectotrophoblast of the skin patch is the nourishment for the young ones. The ovipara species like Bollingera and vivipara species like Gaganophis in show metrophagy. Metrophagy that means feeding on the mother tissue or materials provided from the mother tissue. And in both the cases, 
this oviparous or viviparous species a specialized teeth, embryonic teeth being used and it indicates that both these type of species having different reproductive strategies have same oviparous ancestor. Let us now review the evolutionary status of parental care. Different forms of parental care in amphibia are gained and lost at different rates. Monoparental care is more or less evolutionary stable one whereas biparental care is an evolutionary unstable state in whatever forms it arises. Egg attendance considered to be the simplest form of parental care can be gained quickly and this uh, attend egg attendance strongly supports the idea that the evolutionary origin of this behavior should only require the parent to stay at the site of egg deposition at considerable little cost. The evolution of later elaborations that increase offspring survival which are complex parental care behavior such as active defense of the clutch, prevention of egg dehydration may promote the persistence of this behavior over evolutionary time. Unexpectedly, simpler care forms such as attendance of the tadpole and juvenile stages are gained at rates similar to the those complex care forms like viviparity and at lower rates than attendance at this at egg stage. It is harder to lose complex trait than simpler ones. Specifically egg attendance is lost as quickly as it is gained. It is suggestive of the fact that a change in selection pressure such as higher cost of guarding could lead to an easy loss of this behavior. In contrast, complex parental care like viviparity and brooding are lost at a much slower rate if at all in amphibians. Brooding entails the development of offspring on or inside the parent's body and includes diverse adaptation such as gastric brooding, brooding in the vocal sac or brooding eggs embedded on the dorsum. Tactful transport is also a very complex behavior is lost at relatively low rate. Although apparently simple, transport requires good parental spatial memory of suitable pools with low predation rigs in which the parent is going to release the offspring. And it also involves some level of parental offspring conflict as well as sibling competition, specifically when parents can only take a very few or maybe one offspring at a time in such condition. To gain that transport, sibling used to compete with each other. Together, these characteristics, that is good memory, special memory, parent offspring conflict, sibling competition may explain why transport exhibits moderate rates of evolution. 
We have gone through the story of world of parental care in the amphibia with scientific insight. When you read the process of parental care in a specific amphibia, try to imagine the event that has occurred in nature. It will enable you to understand the process easily also to become a part of the nature both mentally and spiritually. Thank you.